Hey everyone, I need to let you know about a couple things that have transpired with our food line over the last week, and they're both super exciting. First, we just got a fresh batch of our dessert-inspired guilt-free granolas into our warehouse, and I want you to know that they are better than ever, and I mean it. We've updated our flavors to include an all-new dark chocolate that is gonna win over your hearts just like it has mine. And all four of our flavors will crush your cravings while fueling you up with whole grains and, of course, no added sugars. The second thing I want to let you know about is we just announced the launch of our brand new product line. It's our Plant Strong Teas. You might be wondering, what in the world are you doing making teas? Well, listen up. It's been a year in the making, but what we've done is we've taken our whole food plant-based philosophy around food, and now we've applied it to teas. All of our teas contain 100% unrefined hand-plucked teas with specially selected herbs, fruits, and spices, and we never use extracts or flavorings, which almost 99.9% of the teas on the shelf use. Now, what we've done is we've also taken our evidence-based health-promoting ingredients, and all these are deliciously blended and artfully crafted by these industry-leading tea masters that we've found in Sri Lanka. I'm telling you, it is the best tea on the planet. Our hot teas include our Plant Strong Breakfast Tea. We have a black cumin vanilla chai, a golden chamomile that's got turmeric and ginger and just a touch of black pepper and lastly as a nod to our friend dr michael greger we've got a gooseberry green and this tea includes amla which according to dr michael greger and others this amla or it's better known as indian gooseberry is the number one most antioxidant packed whole food on the planet And I want you guys to try all these new teas. Let me know what you think and check out our family iced teas as well. And keep in mind, if you're in a hurry, we have a select number of Plant Strong tea tumblers available as part of our special hot tea tin bundle. Say that five times fast. It will be a great gift to kick off your new year. Just visit plantstrongfoods.com to see all of our product offerings. I see it the same way as nutrition. You can help somebody right there in the office um, and get to the root of their of their issues without necessarily prescribing medications with side effects or sending them to orthopedics for surgery, right? Um, and and so it, I think it's part of my whole new, uh, sort of medical philosophy is when we can do these non-invasive techniques whether it's osteopathic manipulation plant-based nutrition or anything else let's absolutely do these first okay and the vast majority of patients can recover this way i'm rip esselstyn and welcome to the plant strong podcast the mission at plant strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant-based movement We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant-based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment, and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plant Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. Plant Strong family, you're pretty well aware by now that I'm a pretty optimistic guy that tends to look at the bright side of life. And this is why I want to share this special bonus episode with you as we head into 2023 to give us all something to look forward to, which is the future of medicine. My guest today is a young, scrappy, second-year family medicine resident. His name is Dr. Zach Burns. He also works with Dr. Michael Clapper's initiative, Moving Medicine Forward, which is where they go around the globe and speak to medical school students 
about the importance of whole food plant-based nutrition to get to the root causation of chronic Western diseases. I actually met Zach for the first time at a party that was being thrown in Austin, Texas, a welcoming party of sorts for Dr. Michael Clapper and his wife, Elise, who have just moved to, to Austin, Texas. But I was struck at his tenacity, his knowledge, and his social consciousness and his passion for food as medicine for such a young guy, which is why I want to share this with all of you on the eve of this new year. Let's look at this as proof that the needle is moving in the right direction. Medicine is moving forward with people like Zach, Dr. Michael Clapper, and all of the pioneers that we feature on the Plant Strong podcast. The future is bright and will continue to shine that light on those who are paving the way on the Plant Strong podcast. Zach, welcome to the Plant Strong podcast. It's really great to have you on the show. So nice to be here, Rip. Yeah. So now tell me, Zach, so we met a couple months ago at a party for Dr. Michael Clapper. Um, and you are currently in residency. At what point uh, for medicine, at what point do we start calling you an MD or a doctor? Uh, if you wanted to, you could you could start now. So at residents are doctors. Once you graduate med school, uh -huh. you, you have your doctorate. Um, and in residency, you just have a, a partial license. So the work you do falls under an attending physician who's yeah. graduated residency also. Uh, but we're, we're doctors in training, you could say. And uh, actually, there, there are, I think you've had some other osteopathic physicians on the show. So my degree is a DO, actually, not yes. a MD. And we're licensed to do the same things. There's just a slightly different philosophy of training. And then the tangible difference is we're, we're uh, educated in osteopathic manipulation, which is a hands-on technique uh, for a variety of medical conditions. Uh huh. And so um, did you specifically choose going in, into becoming a DO instead of an MD because of um, certain things that it allowed you to do? And a certain yeah, philosophy so, around it. Exactly. So I find osteopathic manipulation to be a similar modality to plant-based nutrition. Hmm. Um, and I'll explain. So imagine if for those unfamiliar, this is this is a hands-on manipul manipulation technique. It looks sort of like a blend of physical therapy and a chiropractor and massage, but it's it has its own perspective because through the, through our medical training. Okay. And, and it's non-invasive is the key. So I see it the same way as nutrition. You can help somebody right there in the office, um, and get to the root of their, of their issues without necessarily prescribing medications with side effects or sending them to orthopedics for surgery. Right. Um, and, and so it, I think it's part of my whole New, uh, sort of medical philosophy is when we can do these non-invasive techniques, whether it's osteopathic manipulation, plant-based nutrition, or anything else, let's absolutely do these first. Okay. And the vast majority of patients can recover this way. That sounds pretty good. And so tell me as a DO, um, are there uh, like just as many specialties that you can get into as an MD? Yes. Yeah. So you're eligible to yeah. subspecialize in all the same fellowships. You yeah. can be a, uh, you know, so if you go the internal medicine route, then you can subspecialize in the ologies, cardiology, pulmonology, rheumatology. I'm personally in a family medicine program. And so, so we don't subspecialize in those fields. We have our own subspecialties. They're often based around, uh, patient populations. So you, you can do obstetrics, you can do geriatrics. Okay. Um, you, you can do integrative medicine or lifestyle medicine. So uh, it, obesity medicine, there are so many options within family med. And, uh, so that's, 
It's just to give you the so, yes. Yeah, so, so have you decided within family practice what's subspecialty you're going into? So it's whether or not I'll do a fellowship. I may not. I think that this program will equip me really well to mm -hmm. take care of patients the, the way so I can practice in a sincere way that'll help people heal. Uh, if I did a fellowship, it would either be in lifestyle medicine or obesity medicine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And so uh, at what point in your life did you decide that you wanted to go into medicine? It was somewhere around sophomore biology class. I, there, there was some, some moment of revelation. So we had to submit a little note card to the teacher indicating whether we'd like to be placed in honors chemistry next year or, or not. And, and, and then with, with a explanation as to why. So I wrote honors chem and without having consciously considered this, I wrote um, because I want to go to medical school. And when it came out of my pencil, mm -hmm. I, I realized that maybe there's something there. So that was the first moment. I, I was just fascinated by the human body and all of its intricacies. Right, right. Nice. Um, yeah, isn't that interesting sometimes how when something comes to us just like in a flash like that and, you know, maybe, we, maybe we've been thinking about it, but we don't even know that we have. So that, that, that's pretty cool. Um, and so my understanding is, is that you grew up in a family that did not eat red meat. Is that correct? That is correct. And why I did mean, your family, why did your family not eat red meat? My mom and dad had both been vegetarian at times. Um, when they had kids, it was the convention of their era or community. They thought you needed some meat or some animal products to raise healthy kids. So they kind of relapsed into a uh, partial vegetarianism. They continued to keep away red meat, uh, mostly for health and environmental reasons. They knew that red meat production was very resource intensive and that it was, it had been linked to cardiovascular disease and overweight. And so I grew up without red meat and I had that foundation that admittedly made it easier to get rid of uh, the other animal products. Hmm. And, um, I think your family also is very socially conscious. Um, so what's behind that? They are. Yeah. I, I like to say I, you know, they, they, my mom was the original, original, uh, nutrition geek and, and I learned from her and, and took it up a notch. And now I, bother my my parents about um, being more exclusively plant-based they've come a long way so many of my family and friends have become largely plant-based and it's really exciting it keeps me going and makes me feel like i could have the same influence on on many patients uh colleagues and their patients so what was behind that you know i think they were both particularly concerned about the environment growing up in the 60s and 70s and, and seeing the degradation of our land and water. And they were active, not uh, professional uh, activists, but in different areas of life, they, they advocated for social change. So I, I got the bug from them and, and I think climate change was my, my in in college. It's how I became politically active. And I discovered the, the connection between the climate and, and food politics and factory farming. And, went from there. Hmm. Well, what's really neat for me to see is, so how old are you? I'm 30. So you, so you're 30. Um, wow. So, so you went to, so you went to college, you got out, you did what, four years of medical school and now yes, but I had, yeah, I had a few years between college graduation and med school where I was working in community health and, and political organizing. Oh, you were. Well, that's really neat. That's really neat. So did you know in that time period that you were going to be going to medical school? I did. That was always the goal. Uh -huh. I, I just wanted some time to explore the world, put the notebook and the textbooks down for a minute and uh -huh. work, get some experience. Yeah. So what's interesting to me is, so when did you start to... Um, 
hear and when did it start to resonate with you that we got to do something because planet earth is, is is heating up and it's in trouble i think pretty quickly after i landed on campus uh, i went to a pretty socially active college and found it energizing to be part of these environmental initiatives there were several groups my big thing actually in college was composting so i became the coordinator of the compost committee and we would collect the, the spoils from every different yeah. dining halls and uh and dorms and mix and churn all the material on the campus farm and it was a nice way to get out of the lecture hall and work with my hands get dirty and know i was doing something decent for our local environment and then we were involved in state and national uh climate issues so I, I just when you're at those rallies you know the feeling it's very energizing because you see that other people care a great deal about this and that we can actually influence policy when we you know get on the street and use our voice mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah so this was back in what was this 11 years ago when you started college 12 years ago yeah, I guess I started in You're 18? 2010. 2010. When I when I was a freshman in college. Yep. 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 Hmm. Cause I mean, I mean, I I have been well aware of, you know, the connection between animal agriculture and and climate change and you know how they produce more greenhouse gas emissions than anything else. But probably for, I would say now a good decade, right? And maybe a little bit more than that, but it's, it is, it is phenomenal to me when I think about how there wasn't anything in any of the newspapers. It wasn't part of the conversation really collectively until like 2015, 16 is when it kind of made its way under the radar. Um, and now it's like, you know, you can't go a day without hearing about it 50 times. About plant-based nutrition? No, no, or climate change, climate change yeah. right? Yeah, I, you know, I remember talking to a good friend in college who was uh, in politics, he was studying politics, and he, we were talking about whether climate change would ever become a mainstream political issue. Oh my God. So this was somewhere around 2011 or 12. He said, nah, no way. And um, fortunately, it, it is central and even in the debates, maybe yeah. more on one side than the other, but um, it's, it's right there prominently. Mm -hmm. And I'm encouraged that factory farming and our food system might have the same trajectory. It yeah. might become a mainstream political issue. Yeah. Yeah. No, very much so. I know that the Clinton uh, global initiative is going on right now. And I think this is going to be a major, major topic uh, as well. Um, so speaking of plant-based, so you grew up kind of without red meat because of the, you know, your parents were socially conscious, but what got you from being a vegetarian to going all, all in for plant-based, uh, the, the plant-based lifestyle? Yeah, well, so I, I was eating a lot of birds and fish and, uh, dairy products and eggs, to be honest until I got to college and, and I had this freshman seminar called American food and sort of the name speaks for itself. I lost the taste for, for meat, uh, you know, a few weeks into the course. Yeah. So that was easy for me. I don't remember that being challenging at all to give up the birds and fish. What was, but, but I was, I was still eating the dairy and eggs for several years and then uh, I, I was a philosophy major, right? Alongside pre-med. And my advisor was the type of philosopher who looks at ethics and really critically considers right and wrong and different moral philosophies and how we can justify certain actions. And within that realm, she looked at animal ethics. And I took this course with her called Humans, Animals, and Nature, where I pretty quickly discovered that the, the way we were procuring animal products was completely unjustifiable. And if I wanted to 
be a decent person you know, or whoever I wanted to be. I just couldn't keep eating animal products. So, and yet my favorite foods were pizza and ice cream. Mm -hmm. And it took me a couple of years to let them go. And you've let them go. <laughs> I've let them go. Yes. And I, you know, I wish I did this much earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, congratulations. And so now you, uh, you've been like knee deep in the plant-based lifestyle for how long? So I've been vegan since 2014. It's been eight or nine years. Uh -huh. And one of the things that, that you, um, you're doing now is, is you're, you're helping Dr. Clapper with his initiative, moving medicine forward, which is really, really cool. Tell me, and I want you to talk to me about and let everybody know what moving medicine forward is. But before you do, so, so everybody that's listening, you know, Dr. Clapper has been a regular on the Plant Strong podcast. I believe I've had him on three different times. We'll put in the show notes all the different episodes and the number. But um, he is really just an absolute gem of a human being. And you somehow saw him or saw him in some documentaries and was really enamored with, I think, his whole ethos. So will you talk to me about like how you came to know Dr. Clapper and what inspired you to reach out to him? Enamored is the right word. I watched Cowspiracy. I saw his scene where he talks about baby calf growth fluid yeah. as cow's milk. And I was totally enamored. I thought he was charming, hilarious, and communicated really well. Um, with a lightness, but but uh, a strength of conviction. And among all the plantricians, it, it, his style resonated with me. Mm. So, he, I mean, he was a hero. If you asked me, uh, you know, before we met, who are a couple of public figures you'd like to meet more than anybody else in the world? He'd be right up there. Uh, yes. And so I'm still starstruck. I, I got to not only host him, to speak to my med student group, but then I've been working with him and actively assisting his initiative called Moving Medicine Forward. And let everybody know what um, what is Moving Medicine Forward and what do they do? So this is an organization that, with a mission to build a generation of physicians who are finally equipped to tackle the chronic illnesses that are plaguing our society, whether it's obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, all of these autoimmune processes that were triggered by lifestyle. So Dr. Clapper has been doing this for decades, right? But it, he wanted to, after he retired from clinical work, largely, um, he wanted to influence the next generation. So that's where moving medicine forward comes in. Mm-hmm. And um, who do they who do they speak to? So when when Dr. Clapper speaks on campus, do you mean? Yeah, yeah. So so it's it's right. The, our target audience is medical students. So they're somewhere between college and residency. They'll be fully licensed doctors within five years, and they really need this information. So that's our our target. Um, because while they're learning the ins and outs of human physiology and anatomy, um, we need to introduce these concepts of lifestyle medicine and the power of nutrition uh, to prevent and often reverse disease. Because otherwise, as Dr. Clapper likes to say, uh, our, uh, what does he say? Uh, uh, pharmacosclerosis will, will set in because pharmacology is probably the biggest piece of the med school curriculum. Uh, it's certainly the most complicated and requires the most uh, time studying. So that's our model right now. Med students learn about drugs, but I like to say, I, I didn't pursue med school. It's, it's really, it's, it's a lot of work, um, not to mention the tuition. I didn't do all this to become a glorified drug dealer. I actually wanted to help people out, um, which is the same with my colleagues. So we need to find ways, um, in addition to 
uh, in primary to pharmacology to help people uh, prevent and reverse disease. Well, so Dr. Clapper has been doing the moving medicine forward for, I think it's like three or four years, maybe even a little bit more. At what, right. at what, at what point did you get involved? I was lucky to be there right at the beginning. So I had started a group on campus called plant-based healthcare. And we asked Dr. Clapper to speak. We had no budget. Mm -hmm. It was a long shot. I submitted something through his website and miraculously he, he said, yeah, I'll speak and don't worry about the cost. So he spoke, you know, there were hundreds of people there. We had not only medical uh, students and faculty, but we had people from all over South Florida. I was at Nova Southeastern. And I think there were 400 people there. It was this incredible event. Afterwards, we had this meeting outside with some of his volunteers. And we were talking shop about how can we make this uh, more impactful across the country. So th these were some of the initial conversations. And when I asked him if I could participate, in his, in his movement, assist him in any way. He said, actually, yeah, we're, we're launching this moving medicine forward and I need a med student who understands how this is going in 2022 or whatever year it was. And uh, so that we can communicate with other med student leaders and create some infrastructure for change. So have you, have you seen him um, present to a whole bunch of medical students before? Yeah. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I'm curious, like, so what, what is the reaction uh, when these medical students hear this kind of, you know, old man that kind of, I, you know, my nickname for him is Gandalf, but they hear this <laughs> white bearded Gandalf, you know, a spouse about, uh, the power of a whole food plant-based diet and how it's the most powerful tool in their, in their toolboxes as, as potential MDs. Are they, are they open to hearing his message or do they think that he's a bit of a quack? No, they're very receptive overall. I think people are really captivated when he speaks. It's partly his talents and communication yeah. and largely the content as well. I think people are hungry for this information. They're, especially if they're students or residents who've started their clinical rotations in the hospitals, they realize that eight out of 10 people on the floors were there because of what they've been eating. And it's frustrating. And they see that run of the mill medicine is failing us and just prescribing and then increasing the dosage and running some tests and doing surgery. Ultimately, it's not satisfying. And, uh, there's just so much cost and human suffering. So mm -hmm. people are really fascinated by what Dr. Clapper has to say. They're different. Uh, people have different foundations, right? There might be someone who's hip to lifestyle medicine and just needed this push. And some people are starting from scratch, but I think he appeals to most everybody. Hmm. Well, that's, that's really great to hear. That's what I imagined, but it's always, you know, great to hear that. Um, so are you still in residency right now? Or are you done? Yeah, I'm a second year out of three. So, oh, okay. Second year out of three. And then after residency, what do you have? So then I'm a free agent. Yeah. Um, it's time to get a job and pay off some loans and, um, uh -huh. see if we can expand the, the movement in lifestyle medicine. All right. Gotcha. Um, hmm. So as, so as your, as your second year in residency, talk to me about some of the ups that you've been able, ups that you've seen and some of the downs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been, it's been overall really encouraging. I find that patients and uh, my classmates, my co-residents are so receptive. They love learning about lifestyle medicine. Same thing, they, they have different starting points, but people are on the whole incredibly receptive. The faculty, uh, or the, so my teachers, they've been practicing for however many years. They are also usually really receptive. Sometimes there's a little pushback because they didn't get this education in med school either. And 
they might not be comfortable uh, mm-hmm. talking about de- de-prescribing or uh, talking about a, a sort of radical nutrition program for somebody instead of starting meds. So it's a balance. Uh, I still have so much to learn from them and I need to be humble about, right? I, I, I don't have those years of experience. So we need to keep everything really safe. But at the same time, I've been lucky to help facilitate Dr. K's masterclass. I've delved pretty deep into the physiology of food and the literature around nutrition so that I'm comfortable working with people on lifestyle and pretty deep level and educating my classmates around that. So, that, I mean, I'd say some, some ups have included starting a dining hall task force at my hospital where we've already implemented changes to the patient menu, um, the cafeteria for staff. We've introduced a ton of plant-based options. So that's, I think, makes a difference. And we're working on, they already have excluded red meat from the cardiac menu. Oh. Makes sense. Uh, and so right now we're advocating for them to also exclude red meat in the diabetic menu because people with diabetes, the most likely cause of death is cardiovascular disease. So we want to keep things consistent. Mm. Dining hall task force was one exciting initiative. Um, we have a plant-based healthcare group of residents and, and, and nurses and some attendings in the community, attendings, you know, the fully licensed docs. Mm-hmm. So we share local events and literature and uh, recipes. And so th- we've launched a, a small movement so that people can feel like they're not alone in promoting plants. Yeah, that's really important. Um, so, how, how, what's the size of your, what was the size of your medical school class and how many people are going through residency with you? Yeah, it's a stark difference. So the, my residency class was relatively enormous. It, we had about 220 people who ultimately got graduated mm-hmm. per class. And then here in residency, it's 16 per class. So it's really a promotion, right? Especially when, you, when you're working with the administrator, there's such a smaller ratio. There's more attention on you and cultivating you as a, as a doctor. And so it's been a really nice change and there's more responsibility. And, and now as a second year, I get to teach the, the interns, the first years. So getting to impart some wisdom on them. Hmm. Um, do you think that one of the reasons why Dr. Clapper's lecture is so well received is because you guys are DOs and maybe there's a little bit different mentality? Like I'm wondering mm-hmm. if have you seen him deliver his lectures at you know uh, and medical yeah. medical students that are getting their MD, not their DO? Oh yeah, and and when I answered before, I was including the okay. MD students he speaks to. He he um. You know, he speaks at schools all over the world and uh, they're mostly MDs. So I, yeah. overall, everybody is very receptive. Do DOs have a special appreciation for for this? Maybe, you know, overall, um, I think most DOs practice similarly, despite the, the small variation in our philosophy and training, you mm-hmm. know, but, but DOs on the whole, are just as susceptible to falling into mainstream mm-hmm. medicine as anyone else. Yeah. So when did you read the book Overdosed America? Because I, I heard it had a fairly large impact on you. It did. That was just this year, you know, it's maybe late winter and it, it was very profound for me. It, you know, I knew that, So coming out of this work, I'm talking about it with climate change and political organizing. I knew about corruption in our society. Companies want to earn profits and they sort of influence policy. I'm pretty aware of the nastiness going on um, in Washington, D.C. But but this book finally provided some examples of pharmaceutical corruption. And, and just how 
the pharmaceutical industry, the device industry, hospitals, they've totally infiltrated medical education. Mm. So that when, when I'm in my didactics and we're learning the guidelines for, you know, the treatment of hypertension or cardiovascular disease or diabetes, <laughs> sometimes the lectures are just a regurgitation of pharmaceutical propaganda. And it's really scary, actually, because if you don't look into that and realize, then you're just indoctrinated uh, into status quo mainstream medicine that has largely been written by the companies that are, stand to profit from, from their products being sold a billion times over. So Overdose America is by a Dr. John Abrahamson, it was written in 2004. He's a family doctor, so his, his clinical experiences resonated. And he went really deep into the literature and identified the big pharma tactics, how they design studies that favor the outcomes that they want, um, how they, go, they devise these really elaborate marketing campaigns to sometimes create a medical condition so that they can sell a drug for it. Uh, other times they decide that, okay, this drug has worked for cardiovascular disease. Let's see if we can create a new indication in diabetes and make twice as much. Mm. And it inspired me to do a deeper dive and look at, so here, here's one example. Can I share one? Um, no, I was, awesome just say, I was just going to say, <clears throat> I would love to hear an example of one. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, you know, I'm not anti-pharmaceutical. So sometimes people really need medicine. Okay. And, and obviously medical technology, including meds have transformed our, our healthcare system. It's sometimes in really important ways. Okay. But I think for chronic diseases, we've gone way overboard. <laughs> so for example, there's a class of diabetes medication called SGLT2 inhibitors. So they basically make you pee out your sugar. So they're, they're employed in the treatment of diabetes. They, bec they started becoming mainstream in the last few years. And there was so much hype about SGLT2 inhibitors that after reading this book, Overdose America, I decided to look into it. Where is this hype coming from? And I found that the major studies that led to these clinical guidelines of when and how much of an SGLT2 inhibitor to use, th those studies were funded by the manufacturers of the, of the same medications. Mm. Um, and, and then I, so there's just this inherent conflict of interest that makes you really wonder where our guidelines are coming from. Um, and recently, I presented a, an overview of, of these um, of statins. So people are usually familiar with statins. They lower cholesterol and supposedly uh, prevent cardiovascular disease. Now, they, they seem to have some good results with peop in people with existing cardiovascular disease. But this, this literature review was about whether you should start somebody on a statin just to prevent heart disease in the first place. Right. So primary prevention. And when you look into it, and they, they say this in the review, uh, 23 out of 26 of the randomized trials that they include and, and glean the, the insights from, they're funded by the statin industry. And so you just, you, you know, it makes me skeptical. Um, and I want my colleagues to have the same level of, of, um, of concern, not necessarily to boycott these medications, but just to be thoughtful and use lifestyle primarily. Yeah. No, I think, I think that some of the stats that I've heard is that with statins, yes, it can be helpful with somebody that's had a previous cardiovascular event in preventing another one by, I think I've read up to 30%. But if you haven't, it um, 100 people have to be taking a statin medication for five years 
for one person to get some sort of a benefit from it. So it's almost the same as a, if not, well, you'd be better off probably taking a placebo uh, is, is my understanding based upon those numbers. Yeah. And one of the tactics that they use is they compare a statin to a placebo and that's where they get the results, but they never compare a statin to reducing red meat by 25% or taking a walk three times a week. Because I believe that they're afraid that if they publish those results, it would not look good for statins. Right. It, um, just these basic lifestyle changes uh, often way outcompete the chronic disease meds that we regularly prescribe. No, 100%. And not only, do, I think, do they outperform uh, statin drugs, but you also don't have any side effects, right? And the side effects that you do have are very positive. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and spill over into many places in our lives. Um, so what are some of the lectures that you've been delivering to, uh, to med students? So I've been zooming out into public health land. Um, one of them is called plant-based nutrition for social justice. And I've, I've delivered this presentation several times now to med students and community organizations. And it's really well received. I'm, I'm glad to give it. It's a heavy presentation. So we talk about the effect of food, uh, our food system on the environment, disproportionate chronic disease among low income and non-white Americans, uh, global, global poverty, uh, deforestation, and then, and then we talk about other social justice movements, whether it's for racial equality or gender equality, or and, and we make some comparisons. Because if I can be honest, I think we'll look back on factory farming, like, an, like other forms of, of human slavery and genocide. And so I, I make some pretty clear comparisons to help the audience make connections between what's going on um, and what we've seen historically. So it's this kind of big picture analysis of our food system that's been uh, exciting to be able to provide for people. Mm. Then uh, th there's one more. So the food environment and zoonotic disease mm. is the other main one I've been giving recently. So that looks at following many plantricians trying to help people make that connection between our food system and the infections that are coming from livestock production or uh, poaching and um, bush meat production and trade coming out of COVID-19, right? Because all evidence suggests that COVID-19 originated from, from the wet market in Wuhan, China, where these different species come from around the world. Um, to be dismembered and sold. And it's a perfect breeding ground for a novel pathogen like SARS-CoV-2. So, yes. and yet, you know, there are only a few people discussing that. And if, if, if we don't get the message out, right, we're projected to have these novel pathogens coming from uh, factory farms, like an like a avian influenza, that could be way more transmissible and severe than COVID-19. So it's pretty frightening. Um, and I, I wanna show med students that there are, big, there are bigger public health issues to consider here. I would say that it's very frightening to say the least, right? I mean, if we could have another zoonotic disease that is more severe than COVID-19 and is more easily spread, um, yeah, that, that, that just might be the undoing of us. I mean, yes. it's not pretty. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if it can be prevented, right, just by simply us, you know, re severely eradicating and ratcheting back our animal consumption. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, yeah. why, uh, that's why I think for me, if, if I want to maximize my, the impact in my career, Mm -hmm. It's it's going to be talking about plant-based nutrition because it touches so many 
social problems. Um, and, and so I, I just admire what you do and what our whole lifestyle medicine community is doing, because I think it has this outsized impact where to the extent we can transform our, our food system to one with plants, uh, more central, we, we can tackle so many disparate issues, uh, including I think importantly, the ethical issues around animal exploitation. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so are you hopeful about what the future of medicine uh, might look like here going out 10 years? I am hopeful I, because I've seen patients recover already. I've only been a resident 13 or 14 months and with basic nutrition coaching uh, toward an unprocessed plant-based eating pattern, but not even some of these patients don't even go all the way and they've had dramatic recoveries just in my limited experience as a doctor. And so I'm really encouraged that more people discover how they can reclaim their vitality through nutrition. It'll, it'll spread in this social movement. And I'm encouraged about the medical movement, although we have a long way to go, right? Because there are a lot of residency programs where, as I said, their didactics are lectures where they just kind of regurgitate those guidelines that have been really influenced by the drug companies. Um, and so we have a lot of education to do, but I think we'll get there. I think um, I'm encouraged by what's happening nationally and recognizing the incredible cost burden and you know time out of work burden and all these f- stemming from chronic disease. So we're going to have to tackle it. And I think now is the time. So you, you've used the word didactics twice in the last 40 minutes. What does didactics mean for those that don't know what that word is? Sorry about that. Th- that's our teaching. We, because we're still doctors in training, we have a, a half day every week designated for, for teaching. And we, we go through lectures. We do simulations. Um, and that's what didactics is, just the classroom portion of my life. Ah, thank you. Um, and you mentioned you had some stories of people that, you know, you've maybe you've worked with or somebody that you know has worked with, and they've had some really nice turnarounds. Can you give me some examples? Yeah. So I'm thinking of one fellow, he's a middle-aged African-American man with all the issues. So diabetes, hypertension that was intractable. There were several medications for his blood pressure and they just weren't doing it. Um, He was morbidly obese. He had gout where his big toe frequently, at least once a month, you'd have a gout flare where it was just incredible pain in his feet. What's morbidly Um, obese? Like how heavy? So that's when your BMI is over 40, your body mass index. Um, these are, we was have, he, was he 400 pounds? Was he 500? Was he, he was in, he was in the mid three hundreds. Okay. So for his height, um, he ruled in for we, we either, you can call it severe or morbid obesity. And the problem with severe obesity, there are a few problems, but it, it your, your risk of complications, heart attack, stroke, everything, they're actually way higher than regular obesity. And what we've seen over the last 10, 15 years is not only the enlargement of the average human, but an increase in severe obesity itself with all of its inherent risks. Hmm. So anyway, there's this fellow, he was, he's such a, such a nice guy, so appreciative. And he was sick of being sick. So we got him on a plant-based diet. And one thing, he, he also discovered green tea and he really loved his green tea. He put a little apple cider vinegar in it. Um, and he just within months, he stopped having his gout flares. Mm. Okay. Um, his, his blood pressure became much more controlled. And almost most importantly, he just 
felt better. And he said, I can finally, I have energy. I'm sleeping. I have a more positive outlook on life. And he, I was checking in on him on the phone. And he said something that I'll never forget. He said, Zach, the, the notion of getting meat out of my life was the best thing you could have told me. No one's ever told me that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, that's all it takes. Um, we just need more clinicians educating patients. They, they're not very resistant in most cases. They just need that education. Mm-hmm. And so he's one, you know, I had somebody who I met in the hospital. I was on my medicine rotation. And he comes in with, um, he had a pulmonary embolism. Um, turned out that he, he was predisposed to the, to the, um, the, the thick, thicker blood and the, the um, pulmonary embolism because he had prostate cancer. Okay. So we got him on a plant-based diet and he lost 30, 40 pounds. He feels really good. He's in remission from prostate cancer. Um, and the, the evidence is pretty clear with prostate cancer. If you, if you want to give yourself the best chance of uh, preventing a recurrence of that prostate cancer, you need an anti-inflammatory food that's going to optimize your immune system so that it can identify those cancer cells, bring down the inflammation and keep you cancer free. And he's one, and just there are more, but just one more example would be, um, oh, I, I just had him in my mind. Oh, here's one. He, he came into the hospital with hepatic cirrhosis. He'd been a drinker. Okay. Mm-hmm. So his liver was sufficiently injured that he was accumulating fluid in his belly. It was really scary stuff. Okay. He was scared about that and it was a pivotal time for him. He, he stopped drinking and not only that, but he went plant-based more exclusively than the other two guys I mentioned. Uh, he lost an incredible amount of weight beyond the, the fluid weight that he peed out from his cirrhosis. He, he lost fat and adipose tissue and he looks incredible. Um, he's got this summer tan and, and he just, he, he's slim and he feels like a completely different guy. Uh, he, and he's in his sixties and he feels better than he did when he was in his forties. Mm. So, you know, it, it comes to, down to having those conversations with people. Yeah. Nice. Um, so what do you do to, uh, to unwind and de-stress as a resident, um, with kind of, are your hours pretty tough? You know, I can't complain. They're they're tough, but it's like, I am pretty, I'm fueled by plants and, and so, I enjoy working. It's, it's just really gratifying work. Um, so there are long days, especially when you're on hospital rotations. Okay. But there are other residency programs. For example, if you're a surgery resident or an OBGYN resident, those hours are worse. Okay. Yeah. So overall, I can't complain. It's a, it's a more than full-time job. Yeah. So what do you do to unwind? I'd say key for me is exercise. Um, nothing as crazy as you, but I, I'm a daily runner. So I'll run two to five miles and that helps me sit straight the next day and, and focus and um, just be calm. So that's been really central for my mental health. And then I also, um, I also play music. And so um, I'm a j- and, and I, when, when you improvise, it's kind of like for art, for visual artists, it's like sketching. So it's just, you, you can release whatever you're feeling from the day. Cause there's some really miserable situations in medicine. You, there's a lot of tragedy, but you can, you can kind of release what you're feeling, um, through the keyboard. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hear you on the tragedy. Um, it's nice to figure out a, a place for a place to take that tragedy. I saw a fair amount in the fire department. Um, right. So what, um, 
what are some of the thoughts of your fellow residents and and the doctors that you're working with when they find out that you're uh, that you're plant based? Are they supportive? Or do they uh, do they call you names? Do they uh, sneer at you? <laughs> What's that like? Yeah, mostly they're supportive and really interested. So a couple of my, I'd say overall, um, let's say in my class of 16, about half of them have made significant changes in their own lives coming from our conversations about nutrition. So that's really encouraging because then they start to educate their patients. Um, so they're, they're into it. And they come to our meetings and they participate in these different local initiatives that I've set up. Yeah. I'm really grateful for that. Uh, you know, we have a good tight knit residency community and, uh, they're, they're fantastic. They make this a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, the, the faculty are really, you know, I'm, I'm psyched because as I mentioned, they didn't necessarily learn this in med school. They don't practice nutrition with that kind of emphasis. But they realize that there's a ton of interest among the residents and that if they want to keep up, uh, they need to kind of understand what this is about and and catch up with the literature on this. So two of them, for example, are going down for a, uh, for a lifestyle medicine conference in the context of family medicine. Someone else uh, brought to my attention the lifestyle medicine in residency curriculum mm. and and this is something that we bothered the administration about last year and they said oh, i'm not sure if there's enough interest it's kind of expensive but now they're coming to me with it this is uh, someone who wasn't part of that early conversation yeah. so it's great uh at the same time um the, sometimes they are a little bit nervous mm -hmm. uh when nice. when i want to utilize lifestyle over medications because it's not so when, when anything deviates from the standard of care uh you're liable so it, they're protecting the institution and me from liability but that said sometimes it might be a slight overreaction because when you look at it it's not necessarily deviating from the standard of care and when you talk to people the patient and, and make a shared decision to give them the evidence and the options, the pros and cons of, of a decision point. Yeah. Uh, when you have a mutual agreement, then you document that and it's, it's fine. But, you know, I think they're, they're worried about some of the, sometimes they worry about my counseling on dairy uh, because even if they're personally vegetarian, they feel like, well, Dairy's healthy. It's my, it's on my plate. The USDA recommends it, mm -hmm. and so there's just a little catching up to do. And sometimes there's a. Often I'm challenged on the concept of well, what about lower income patients? Can they really do this? Um, so I get that a lot. But of course, yes, you, you, they just need education to find the cheapest. Uh, plant-based options because so this is part of one of my lectures over 90 percent of americans have ready access to a grocery store there is abject poverty and food swamps and deserts but th that's a minority of the population small minority we need to absolutely address those structural problems but th that can't be our excuse not to discuss uh, groceries with the majority of our patients and 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 so it it's about educating them on well actually the plant-based staples are really cheap and um and you know so when we're talking about potatoes and brown rice and carrots and celery and apples uh, this stuff keeps people going and it's it's just so cheap so that's my long-winded response rip yeah big time where do you uh so where do you eat? Do you cook your own meals? Are, are you eating at the dining hall because of what you've done with the task force there? Uh, where do you eat the, the bulk of your meals? Mostly at home. Right. But yes, increasingly, I can eat at the hospital 
because there are vegan options. So that's great. Now they're not necessarily whole food. So even though I can get stuff for free with my doctor card, I, uh, I try to limit what I eat in the hospital because it's going to have oil and salt. Um, it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge when you've been there for 14 hours and you're like, it'd be pretty convenient (laughs) to swipe my card and get one of these things. So I often succumb to that. But, um, when I'm, when I'm behaving, it's, it's homemade food. That's a nice little perk getting free food. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Especially when it's healthy food. So do you have a, a favorite food documentary, um, that you've seen in the last decade or so? Yeah. Oh, oh, there's so many good ones. I really loved uh, Game Changers, of course. I think many listening will be familiar. Yeah. And I recommend it, especially to all my athletic patients, especially the macho dudes who think uh, plants are for, you know, non-macho people. So because you watch that and you realize these people are performing. These are elite athletes doing better than they've ever done on a completely plant-based diet. So that's one I often recommend. And I also, I think the last one I watched was Sea Spiracy. Man, it was really upsetting. Uh, I, I know a lot of people who have cut out other animal products and they've, they've continued to eat seafood um, under the facade that it's healthy. Okay. It may have been healthy 200 years ago to get some omega-3 th- fatty acids when they were scarce in other, in other foods at that time in that place. Okay? But in 2022, there's no reason to eat any seafood. And in fact, it's the same fatty tissue where we, we, we celebrate the, the omega-3 fatty acids. That's the same tissue in the fish where the heavy metals and the plastics and the carcinogenic compounds accumulate. And so it's just not to mention if if we keep going at this rate, our kids and grandkids won't have fish in the ocean. They just, so I'm really alarmed by that. Um, my, my hero, Dr. Clapper was in the movie. So sea spiracy is another one I'd recommend. Hmm. Yeah. Um, we need, we need the oceans to be alive for us to continue to survive as a species. Um, we are really doing our best to, (laughs) to take ourselves down and we really gotta, we gotta turn this big old freighter around. And one of the things that really, you know, you use the word and, and I, it's one of my favorite words is, you know, um, that young physicians like yourself um, are going to help to transform the way that medicine looks over the course of the next, the next decade. And so, and, and that's really, really cool because, you know, what 80% of America's current $4 trillion healthcare bill is attributable to five, count them five lifestyle related diseases that can be prevented with the spoon, the fork, and the knife. And that is powerful. Indeed. Yes, there's so much opportunity here. All right. Well, uh, Zach Burns, any last words you want to say while you're on the Plant Strong podcast and you have uh, a bunch of ears that are listening to you? I just want to say thank you. This this movement, it, it, right, it's important. It um, is my professional interest. It also makes me really happy. I'm so inspired by what you're doing, Rip, and all the plantricians who came before me and showed me that this is a way I can practice medicine in a sincere way where I'm not just copying the status quo and going about it in a way that's kind of disappointing and where it doesn't actually heal people. So I I just want to express my gratitude at everything you're doing and, uh, and th- this this burgeoning movement that's going to include so many more people in my generation, um, you know, pr- soon. Um, you use the word plantrician. Is that is that a big fancy term for a plant based physician? <laughs> I guess so. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's, it's a silly term. Someone no. who's yeah. who's uh, hip to 
the power of plant-based nutrition to prevent and reverse disease. All right. Well, um, Zach, hit me up, man. Give me a, give me a little plant strong fist. <laughs> there you hey, go. All the best to you and everything you're doing. And, uh, I hope to see you in, uh, in Austin soon. Would love to. Thank you, Rip. If you want to learn more about moving medicine forward, visit drclapper.com. And I'll be sure to link that in some of Dr. Burns' resources in the show notes. Let me wish you a happy new year from all of us from Plan Strong. I can't tell you how much we appreciate the support, the follows, the likes, and the reviews. And I can't wait to see what 2023 brings for all of us. See you next year. Thank you for listening to the Plan Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.